Hi, and welcome to a special episode of uh, Design and Analysis of Algorithms class. Special because I'm having to record this lecture and I'm counting on you to watch it outside of our regular class meetings. I picked um, a topic that, that I enjoy for this uh, recorded lecture, uh, the network flow problem. And uh, we'll look at a few different ways, we'll describe the problem, we'll look at a few different ways of solving it, and we'll look at at least one application of what we can do with it. Uh, so let me tell you about network flow. Uh, network flow is a graph problem. It assumes you've got a weighted directed graph like the one I'm showing down there in the bottom left corner of this slide. You've got two special vertices in this graph, the ones I've marked in yellow. One of them is called a source vertex and the other one is called a sink vertex. And here uh, we're going to think of each edge in the graph as having a limited capacity. That's what the weight on that edge means. So if you let me point over here, the 7 here means that you can, um, uh, well, I guess to describe what I mean by limited capacity, I have to, I have to say something about the idea of a commodity. So you're trying to transport something through this network. Uh, and you want to transport as much as, um, as much of it as you can from the source to the sink. Uh, we're calling that, that thing you're trying to transport a commodity. So these, these uh, weights on the edges represent capacity limits on each of those edges. So the 7 here says from uh, vertex S to vertex A, you can move up to 7 units of capacity. Uh, vertex, this edge over here, which um, I guess I'm trying to decide which way to turn my head to read that. I'm going to say that's a 9 on this edge, and that means that um, this has a capacity limit of 9. Uh, often for graph algorithms we're thinking about finding a particular path, but not here. Here we're thinking of using uh, as many different paths as we can, as many different edges as we can to maximize the total amount of commodity that we can get from the source to the sink. So that might include, I don't, we'd have to work it out to see if this really works, but that might include starting by pushing four units of commodity from S to A, and uh, you know, let's say six units of commodity from S to D, and then uh, those units of the commodity would have to, you'd have to find other edges that they could follow there on their way to the sink. Uh, so a flow is the description, uh, is what I was trying to describe there a moment ago. It's a function that says for each edge, how much of the commodity can you move across it uh, on the way from the source to the sink. Uh, so uh, we'll talk about that flow function in a moment, but it essentially says for each edge how much of the available capacity are you using. And later we'll use this notation. Um, it looks like size of F to represent, I think of it as the total flow from the source to the sink. Or you could just describe that as the total amount of, co of commodity that's reaching the sink in the graph. Uh, this is one thing I was trying to avoid saying on the previous slide. There are some rules for how much of, uh, for, for what the flow could be. I think the most obvious one is what we call the capacity constraint. The original weights on the edges represent capacity limits. So if you've got a, an edge like ed, uh, this one we were talking about before, this weight 7 edge, if you l l let me back up where it's easier to see. So from S to A, the capacity limit is 7. So in a flow, you can't move more than 7 units of commodity from S to A. Often for the flow, I think your book uses this same notation, will uh, illustrate how much of that capacity we're using. Uh, with this same notation I'm showing here. So 6 slash 7, you can think of that as saying, well, we're using 6 out of the 7 units of capacity available across this edge. Uh, and like I said a moment ago, the most obvious rule for a flow is you can't use more than the available capacity. So this graph on the left looks okay. We could spot check it, but um, like here, we're using three out of the seven available units of capacity. Up here, we're using all of the capacity for this edge. Same over here. 
Down here, we've got an edge that's not uh, doing anything, or at least we're not pushing any commodity across that. Uh, this is a flow. Uh, like uh, We haven't said this yet, but oh, well, uh, may maybe I said this a moment ago, but we're trying to find the maximum flow. What's the most we can get from the source to the sink? And over here, uh, I've got the question, is this a maximum flow? You can take a look at it for a moment and try to decide that. And there's plenty of available capacity here and there, like here you're only using two of the available nine capacity. Um, in other places, we're underutilizing edges. If I had to argue that this was not a maximum flow, one way I could try to do it is to show how you could increase the flow. Like looking here over at the source, well, this edge, you're using all of the available capacity. This one down at the bottom, there's still some available capacity, so you might be able to move more of the commodity there. Uh, I checked this before I started recording, but if you think of it this way, from S, you could get one more unit of capacity across this edge, and then this edge also has some available capacity. This edge also has, let me say that again a little bit better, hopefully. Uh, from S to A, you've got one more unutilized uh, unit of capacity. Same here, you've got a little more than one, but you can definitely move one more unit of commodity here. Uh, from C, you could move one more unit of commodity down to T. And then from T, you could move one more unit of commodity up to, or sorry, I called this guy T, he's F. Uh, from F, you could move one more unit of commodity up to T. So because I'm sort of showing a way to increase the capacity, this graph on the edge is a, is a flow. I don't think it's cheating anywhere. It's just not a maximum flow. There, we've seen at least one way we could get more out of that graph. Uh, over here on the right, just for fun, I'm showing uh, a, an example that violates the capacity constraint. I made it easy to find because I've got this red edge going here from B to F, where at least according to, to my graph, we're using three out of the available two units of capacity. So that's cheating. That's uh, violating the capacity constraint. So a flow is for every edge, how much of the available capacity am I using? This is kind of showing how we often notate that in a network flow problem. And the capacity constraint says you can't push more than the available capacity. Um, uh, in this graph at the bottom here, this is an example of a maximum flow for this graph. Uh, we could do the same thing. We could go try to find a path. We could go try to find a way of increasing the flow. But I don't think we're going to find it because I tried to make this a maximum flow example. Uh, like a lot of optimization problems, the capacity or the, the total um, uh, flow that you can get from the source to the sink, the amount of commodity you can get there is unique, uh, but the particular flow across each edge may not be. Uh, what I mean is there may be multiple different ways of attaining that maximum flow, the total flow, the total amount of com uh, commodity you're getting there, should be uniquely defined, but the way you get it, may uh, there may be multiple equally good ways of doing that. <clears throat> There's another rule, or typical rule, for a flow, and that is you can't, uh, you can't have overflowing vertices. Uh, I guess uh, this is a time to talk about uh, the source and the sink. Those are special. Uh, we're trying to maximize the total amount of commodity we get from here to here that we get from the source to the sink. So we're kind of pretending S can produce as much commodity as you want. You can have as much flow out of S as you want, provided you're satisfying the capacity constraint, and kind of the opposite over for T. You can have as much flowing into T as you want. There's nothing wrong with you know, any amount of, as far as solving the problem, there's nothing wrong with any amount of commodity reaching T. But everywhere else, you're expected to satisfy flow conservation. And that's what I started to say at the start of this slide. That just means you can't have more flowing in than out. I took, I think, the same graph uh, 
and I made up a flow that satisfies the commodity, con or sorry, the capacity constraint, but vertex B is overflowing. We can spot check that. It looks like uh, I've got seven units of commodity flowing in, but I've only got five units of commodity flowing out. So right there, we're violating flow conservation. So we don't want any leaky vert vertices on the way from the source to the sink. Um, why, so I feel like we've described maximum flow. We've talked about kind of what a valid solution would be. Why do we care about this problem? Well, maybe this problem represents something in the world that you're tr trying to solve, like you're trying to build a network of roads or train tracks, or maybe for us, more typically, uh, a network infrastructure that gives you the amount of capacity you need between maybe two critical uh, locations in that network. And that happens, but I think more often this problem is, uh, is really adaptable so that it can be used to solve a bunch of other problems. Network flow is expressive. I think of it as being expressive enough that a lot of other problems you might have in maybe what looked like unrelated domains, with a little bit of work, they can be turned into network flow problems. So I think of it, like I said, I think of it as being very adaptable to be, uh, so that you can apply it to solving other problems that might not initially look like just network flow problems. Uh, the original, or the way we described it, network flow seems like it might be kind of restrictive. Uh, we said, or, you know, even if I didn't say it, let me try to say it now. In the standard network flow problem, you've got one source vertex and one sink vertex. What if you needed multiple sources? What if the problem you were solving represented something where, uh, you know, you were, let's say you were building a network, and you had multiple places that data was going to originate from on that network. So you, let's say you needed multiple sources. I've got a graph over here on the left that shows that. The standard network flow problem doesn't let you do that, but it's easy to turn a version of the problem like this, where you need multiple sources, into one where you only need one source. And that's what I'm trying to illustrate here. If you wanted multiple sources like S1 and S2, you could simulate that by making an extra source called a, a super source that feeds both of those. So if you needed S1 and S2 to be a vertex, well, maybe the algorithms we're going to come up with can't handle that very well. You could just make another source that feeds both of those with really high capacity links. And then it's as if those are both sources that can, that can have as much commodity as they want, getting it straight from S. You just need to make sure that the part where I say high capacity links, that that's high enough that it would um, uh, it'd be at least as large as the maximum flow that your network could achieve at all. So you could make that, say, the sum of all the edge weights in your graph, and then that should be a good upper bound on the maximum flow for that graph. <clears throat> you could do some other tricks to uh, come up with a better bound for that if you needed to. So uh, the point here is if you need multiple sources, uh, we can simulate that using a trick like this. We could do the same thing on the other end of the graph. If you needed, uh, the standard problem says you can only have one sink. If you thought you needed multiple sinks, like I'm showing over here on the left, you could simulate that the same way. You could have one super sink that gets fed by all of your, all the sinks or all the vertices that you wanted to be a sink. You could just make uh, super high capacity edges from each of the sinks you needed to the super sink. And then that would, um, it'd have the same effect. It would let you get as much commodity as you wanted here and at your other sink all at the same time. Uh, there's one more, um, little trick you can do to adapt uh, the, uh, the rules of the problem to some graph you might want. Some of this depends on the algorithm that you're using to solve uh, network flow. But let's say you wanted an edge that goes between two vertices and you wanted an edge that goes the other way between those two vertices. We said this problem is uh, a directed graph problem. We didn't officially say 
that you can only have one edge between pairs of vertices. But some of the algorithms we'll look at are easier, e sorry, are either easier to think about if you apply that restriction, or they're just, um, uh, or, or sorry, or they might really require that. So let's say you needed something like I've shown down here on the left. Between A and D, it's okay to move up to four units of commodity in this direction or up to three units of commodity in the other direction. So there you need edges going both ways. We call those anti-parallel edges. That just means you've got edges going both directions between uh, vertices. And like I said, some algorithms might have a problem with this. If you needed this, uh, you could, and your algorithm didn't really support it, you can simulate it kind of like we did in the other examples. Uh, you just have to do it, uh, or one way you can do it is like I'm showing here on the right. Uh, it's fine to have an edge going from D to A, but if that means you can't also have an edge going the other way, you can simulate it by introducing a new vertex and then just putting a two-hop path in from A to D, where each the capacity on each hop is the same as the edge you wanted in the first place. So the backward edge, the uh, the edge from A to D, is simulated by this slightly longer path. But we got rid of the problem of, or we got rid of the potential problem of anti-parallel edges. So uh, for our algorithm, I'm going to for the algorithms we'll think about. We'll say it's okay to imagine we only have one source and we only have one sink and we don't have to worry about these anti-parallel edges because if our input graph had any of those things, we could just easily modify it to get rid of those. So let's try to solve um, network flow. At least let's think about how we might solve it. I think the first uh, uh, approach to solving this, we kind of simulated already when we were looking at a graph and trying to think about whether or not its flow was maximum. We tried to look for a way of increasing the flow and for us that ended up finding that ended up being finding a path from the source to the sink where there was some underutilized capacity at, along every edge on that path. And that's really how uh, one of the most um, uh, I want to say one of the most obvious techniques for doing this. I guess I would say one of the first techniques for dealing with this problem, the Ford-Fulkerson method, works like that. It tries. It starts with a flow where there's no flow, and it tries to gradually increase that by finding paths that let it in paths from the source to the sink with some underutilized capacity. To make it easier to to talk about these paths or to look at them. We often talk about or represent the idea of a residual graph. That's what I'm showing in the bottom right corner here. A residual graph has an edge that, or has edges that represent not initial capacity, but remaining capacity between a pair of vertices. Uh, so in our original graph, if you remember from a few slides ago, I talked a lot about this edge from S to A. In the residual graph, I'm also going to have an edge that goes backward, and the weight on these edges is going to represent how much remaining capacity there is with the flow that I'm using. Uh, I've got a picture that tries to illustrate this a little bit better, so I, I guess what I'm trying to show with this picture is, in the residual graph, we're going to have edges pointing in both directions um, between pairs of vertices. Or I guess a better way to say that is for every edge in the original graph, we're also going to have a back edge, a backward pointing edge that represents uh, the capacity going the other way. Uh, why would we need such a thing? Well, here's a way to think about it. If you had two vertices, V sub I and V sub J, and you had an edge pointing from I to J, and let's say you increased the flow across that edge. In my picture, <clears throat> I marked that edge with a capacity of three. If you increase the flow, well, you have got less remaining capacity. So let's say you uh, move one unit of commodity from VI to VJ. 
Well now, like I show in my next picture, you've got two remaining units of capacity left to use, but you could also think of that as saying, well, and you've got one unit of capacity going the other way. If you use that, that would be like reducing the flow. So in the residual graph, and maybe I did a bad job explaining this on this picture, but in the residual graph, you can think of the edges as representing remaining capacity. If I've got three up here, if I've got three units of capacity available from I to J and none available going the other way, if I increase the flow from I to J, uh, now I've got a little bit less capacity going from I to J, but now if I wanted to, I could take that back. Uh, and I've got, or, uh, the way we notate that is, I've got one unit of available capacity from going the other way, and using that would mean um, taking back the flow I did before. I don't know if I made that more clear, but the point is, the weights on the edges in the residual graph show how much remaining capacity there is, and that includes the ability to kind of take back uh, capacity that you've already used in one direction. Uh, I'm just reading the rest of my slide to see if I've covered this. Yeah, so I think the slide is trying to say what, uh, what I was saying, describing the intent behind the residual graph. In a lot of our pictures, at least for the next few examples, we'll be looking at the residual graph. Uh, but if you really had to implement this, you wouldn't necessarily have to implement the whole residual graph. You could just keep up with the capacity along each edge and the current flow along each edge. And then from that, it would be easy to, to compute what we're showing here, to compute the residual capacity in either direction. All right, I kind of said this before, but I didn't get these terms out. So that being said, we'll pretend that the ford fulkerson method works by, trying to, by looking at the residual graph and trying to use some unused capacity along edges. And it'll do this by trying to do what we did a couple of slides ago, trying to find a path from the source vertex to the sink vertex, where every edge along that path has some unused capacity. And for this small graph, that's what I'm showing here. If you start it out with a flow of zero, then this picture shows what your residual graph would look like. Uh, and, you know, so if, if uh, in this graph you can see every edge has some capacity in one direction, uh, but I'm, uh, I don't have any available capacity going in the backward direction. In this graph, I can find a path with some remaining capacity uh, going from S to A, and then to B, and then down to F and then up to T. And I, I don't know if I said this a moment ago, but we'll call that an augmenting path. If I can find a path with positive edge weights with, with available capacity along each of its edges, then that's an opportunity to increase the flow. Again, we'll call that an augmenting path. How much can I increase the flow? Well, it depends on whichever edge has the lowest residual capacity the lowest remaining capacity. And like I'm showing on the left, for this particular path, it's this guy here, uh, this edge with a weight of two. Uh, this edge has seven, this edge has five, this edge down at the bottom has seven. So that's sort of the, um, the bottleneck or the, the limit on how much capacity I can increase. Uh, that's called the critical edge. Once you find an augmenting path, you increase the flow across all of its edges by whatever the weight of the critical edge is. Over on the right, I'm showing what that would look like. So if you increase the flow uh, by, the, the by the residual capacity, by the remaining uh, capacity on the critical edge, then the flow across all these edges goes up by two. So the seven goes down to a five. Now you have five remaining capacity uh, going from S to A. But if you later decided to take some of that back, uh, the residual graph shows that, well, now if you wanted, you could think of the remaining capacity as being 2 going the other way from A to S. Up here, 
this edge that was originally five goes down to three, but you get back two residual capacity going the other way. This edge was our critical edge. Uh, it gets saturated in this uh, when we increase the flow along this augmenting path. So it goes down from two all the way to zero. Uh, and this edge that was previously five goes down, sorry, that was previously seven goes down to five. The Ford Fulkerson technique just keeps doing this. After you've in, uh, let me back up and say, notice that if we were really using the residual graph, it changes as we compute. So whenever we find a residual, or sorry, find an augmenting path, we actually change the weights along those edges to and all the back edges to keep up with how much a remaining capacity there is. Um, the Ford Fulkerson technique says, well, once you find a residual path, keep looking for residual paths. Find another source to sync path where there is some remaining capacity along all of its edges, and then increase by the, um, uh, the lowest weight of those edges, so by the critical uh, edge on that path. Here I'm showing another example, and this sort of follows the previous one. So if you previously used this path as an augmenting path, <clears throat> then you could use the one I'm showing here the one that goes from S to A to B to T. In this path, we've got two edges that are tied as the critical edge. There's nothing wrong with that. It just means they're both going to get saturated when we, uh, when we increase the flow. So this edge has a residual capacity of five, but here and here we have three. So we can increase the flow by three. That saturates both of these edges. Now their residual capacity is zero. And for this first edge, that takes it down to just a residual capacity of two. The Ford Fulkerson technique just keeps doing this until it's found all of the aug augmenting paths it can find, and then there's no way there's no way to increase the flow beyond that. Uh, I've got an example of this, and it should uh, it should be posted online. Let me sorry, I started it up but I want to freeze it right away. All right, so here's our graph. I, uh, I'm checking to see. I think it's the same as the one from the slide. Uh, yeah, it looks like the same graph from the slide. Uh, so this is the original graph where the weights on the edges represent capacity constraints. Turning this into the residual graph just involves edges that point the other way for each of those. Uh, initially, with uh, with capacity of zero. So until we start using some of the capacity in one direction, we don't have any remaining or any residual capacity going in the other direction. So right there's our residual graph. Now we're going to try to find a path from the source to the sink uh, in this residual graph. Uh, but even though I'm drawing them here, we'll pretend that the weight zero edges are not available. They're, they can't be part of a path. That makes sense because if an edge has weight zero, I couldn't use it anyway, or it you know, wouldn't let me increase the capacity. So we're looking for a path from the source to the sink, but one that only uses edges with weight more than zero. Uh, this particular implementation uses uh, probably the easiest algorithm for finding paths, and that is it just uses depth first search. So you can see using depth first search, it first looks at A, and then B, and then F, and then it finds a path to T. The depth first search continues, so as we back up to A, we uh, traversing the graph depth first, we find an edge from uh, A to C, we find an edge to D, We're backing up to S, we find an edge to D, and then we find an edge to E. So this, if you look at it right here, it's the same picture you would expect to see if you just did plain old depth first search in a graph. The green edges are the predecessor edges in the residual graph. The tree edges, sorry, uh, the predecessor edges in the from the depth first traversal. Uh, they're the, uh, the tree edges from a depth first tree for the graph. I don't need all those edges, I just need one path from S to T. 
And in this picture, you could find it by start once once you found a way to reach T, you could find the particular path by starting from T and working your way back, following just these predecessor edges. And internally, that's what my implementation does. Uh, once we finish this traversal, like I said, we just have to pick a resid uh, a path in the residual graph, whatever gets us to T. We increase the flow along every edge on that path by whatever the critical edge is. So in this case, that's this edge with a weight of two. That lets us increase the total flow by two, and I'm showing that up at the top of my uh, animation. Once we finish, you can see now the flow is two. And for Ford, 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 sorry, for Ford Fulkerson, we just keep doing that. So we do another depth first traversal starting from S, or sorry, that little bit of the animation was just showing increasing the flow. So that just finished. We do a, um, another traversal, depth first traversal. Notice uh, here, before when we did the depth first traversal, we were able to use this edge going from B to F, but now we can't because that edge now has a weight of zero. So you can kind of think of in the residual graph, since whenever an edge hits zero for its residual capacity, it's like it doesn't exist anymore. You can't use it until it gets some capacity back. So it's kind of like the structure of the graph changes whenever you, you, whenever you augment the flow by an augmenting path. So we'll let this guy continue. It's doing a depth, still doing a depth first traversal to trying to find a path from the source to the sink. And then once we've done that, there is a path. It's that same one we saw in the slides, that one across the top edges. So we increase its flow by three. And there it's showing increasing the flow. And then we repeat. We run another depth first traversal, looking for a path. And I'll say this quickly, notice we couldn't use this edge now. We used it before, but now its capacity is down at zero. So it's as if that edge doesn't exist. We have the edge going other, in the other direction with the residual capacity of five, but we didn't actually take that in the depth first traversal. So there you can see we found another uh, more well, slightly convoluted path in the residual graph. That lets us increase the capacity by two. And then we do another search. There's our depth first tree. And in that, there's that path from source to sink. So that lets us increase the flow by two. We found another one along the bottom edges that lets us increase the flow by one more. And now uh, it looks like we're done because we just did a depth first traversal looking for a way to get to the source and we didn't even, sorry, looking for a way to get to the sink and we didn't even get there. You can see these two vertices never got visited. Uh, notice that uh, if you can't find an augmenting path, that means there's no path from the source to the sink, at least not one that uses edges with positive edge weights. So there's no more residual, no more paths in the residual graph, no more augmenting paths, so we're done. Uh, so this is the maximum flow. It looks like in this particular graph it's a flow of 10. If we wanted to recover the flow function, uh, we could do it by reading it off the residual graph, uh, we just have to do a little bit of, of work to do that. Here you can see this edge had a capacity of seven. We used all of that, so now it has a residual capacity of zero. And at least if we knew what direction the original edge is pointed, we could read that off the residual graph here. All right, so going back to our slides. Uh, so we ran, we had a look at what Ford Fulkerson does. Um, we noticed a couple of things. Uh, looking at this. Uh, I maybe could have said them better, but I made the point that once you reach maximum capacity, there's a, uh, you, you can't find any more paths from the source to the sink. And I was really talking about this idea. Once you reach maximum capacity, there is sort of, there is a, a break 
in the graph from the source to the sink. And we're really talking about a cut in that graph. Uh, just like I think we talked about this when we were talking about Prim's algorithm. A cut is a way of chopping through certain edges, a subset of the edges, so that there's no path from one part of the graph to another. Uh, and here, the part we care about is the source to the sink. Um, the minimum cut in a graph is the lowest total weight cut you can make that separates the source from the sink. And over here, you can, well, you, you could look around and try to verify this. But I think the minimum cut over here is this dotted line that I drew. If you got rid of this edge of weight three and this edge of weight seven, there wouldn't be any more paths from source to sink. And I think that's the cheapest way to do it in this graph. If you let me change the graph a little bit, like over here, I'm showing a similar graph, but I increase this edge's capacity. It still has a minimum cut, it's just in a different place. So in this graph, I think you have to cut these four edges to get rid of all paths from the source to the sink. Why do we care about cuts in graphs? Well, it turns out that's just another way of thinking about the max flow problem, or it's sort of an equivalent problem. There's uh, there's a theorem, the max flow min cut theorem, that kind of says three things. Uh, like, it, like it says on my slide, the max flow min cut theorem says if you've got a weighted directed graph, G, and you've got a flow, F, in that graph, the following three things are equivalent. Uh, that F, if, if it's a maximum flow, then you can't find any more uh, augmenting paths in the residual graph. That's kind of, uh, we didn't say it until now, but that's kind of what Ford Fulkerson is depending on. If F is a maximum flow, I can't find any or, uh, more augmenting paths. Or I guess it, it thinks of that the other way around. If there are no more augmenting paths, then I've found the maximum flow. So those first two are equivalent, and that last one is the one that we're talking about now. If, um, if F is a maximum flow, then that is also the weight of the minimum cut in the graph that separates the source from the sink. This is worth knowing about, uh, partly because I made the point that uh, max flow is very adaptable to other problems, and sometimes it's in an obvious way. Sometimes it's uh, via this uh, max flow min cut theorem. Sometimes you might have a graph and you're essentially looking for a cut in that graph, a minimum cut in that graph. And this is reminding you that the same algorithm, if you had a good algorithm for max flow, you could use it to find uh, a minimum cut in a graph if that's what you really needed. <coughs> um, thinking about Ford Fulkerson, it was sort of our first attempt at how to solve this problem. Uh, some people might say it's not quite an algorithm because it doesn't specify how to find augmenting paths. That's not a big deal, but um, if you, uh, I, I guess an algorithm, you would say, should have every step well specified. And if you leave it up to me to find augmenting paths, I could make some really dumb choices. And that's what this graph at the bottom is supposed to show. This is one that exhibits can exhibit really poor runtime if you choose bad augmenting paths. Uh, so just looking at this as a human, you can tell the maximum flow must be 2,000. You'd use all the available capacity in all of these edges, and this middle edge, you, it doesn't really help, at least not for this graph. But a structure like that could trick an algorithm into making some bad choices, It'll still find a maximum flow, but let's see what could happen. So starting from this graph, its aug or sorry, its residual graph would look like what I'm showing up here at the top. So I just added back edges for all of the original edges that currently uh, have no available capacity. But as I start finding augmenting paths, let's say the first one I find is the one that goes from S to A down to B and then up to T. If I pick that as the augmenting path, then this middle edge is the critical edge. I can increase the flow by one, and once I do that, my residual graph looks like this. So I'm using almost none of the capacity here. I'm using almost none of the capacity down here. 
I'm using all the capacity across this edge that was going down. So in the residual graph, if I wanted to, I could move one unit in the other direction. And if your algorithm's not too smart, or if it makes a bad choice, that might be what it chooses to do next. So after you've used this augmenting path, looking at the next slide, well now you could use this augmenting path, going from S to B, up to A, and then to T. But if you use that one, you still get to just increase the flow by one. And now you've got, for, for this middle edge, you saturated it. So now you've got an edge going in the other direction. That lets you, if you're not careful, pick this again as an augmenting path. And you could just go back and forth doing that. And here, I could, I could have made it even worse. Uh, or I, I guess, let me say, here it's going to take a while to reach uh, maximum flow. And I could have made it worse by making these thousands into millions instead. Uh, this shows uh, kind of how bad Ford Fulkerson uh, just in general might behave if it makes bad choices. Let's try and do an analysis of it real quickly. In each iteration of Ford Fulkerson, it tries to find an augmenting path. And we're depending on that uh, right now, we did that with DFS, and normally we'd say, well, DFS is O of V plus E, uh, and of course, as long as the graph is connected, you've got at least, or about as many edges as you have vertices. Uh, you've got at least V minus one edges, or it's not connected at all. So in this case, I, we could safely say, all right, that's the same as O of E to do the DFS, once you find an augmenting path, you increase the flow across that and repeat. So every iteration is O of E execution time. So the only question is how many iterations might you have to do? And that's really what we're talking about here. For a graph like the one we were just looking at, you might have to do an awful lot of iterations. A number of iterations that depends on the maximum flow. And here we're depending upon this. We could have used this notation a couple of slides ago, but Remember, size of f, uh, we're thinking, that, thinking of that as meaning uh, the current flow out of the source or into the sink. And we'll say f star means the maximum flow. So size of f star is the, uh, the maximum flow from the source to the sink. And we just saw that you could have a number of iterations that depends on the size of the flow itself. If you back, back up and look at this example, it's going to run for an iteration, uh, it's going to run for 2,000 iterations the way we built this graph, at least if uh, Ford Fulkerson keeps making bad choices for increasing the flow. Uh, so that gives us to a total runtime of uh, O of F star iterations, each one costing us E, O of E computation. So that gives us a total running time of E times F star. And like it says on my slide, that's bad because that is an algorithm whose running time depends on the magnitudes in the input. It doesn't just depend on the structure of the graph, but it depends on whatever the maximum flow is. And like I have started to say before, that means in a graph like this, I could make it as bad as I wanted just by making these thousands into bigger numbers. Uh, so that shows probably why you wouldn't use Ford, Ford Fulkerson just by itself, why we might want a smarter way of doing that. And kind of our next candidate for solving these problems is called the edmonds karp algorithm. It is almost the same thing as Ford Fulkerson. It just avoids this um, potential pathological behavior by being a little smarter about how it chooses an augmenting path. We just saw that, well, without any other constraints on it, the Ford Fulkerson technique might choose a bad augmenting path like this. Edmunds Karp will never choose a path like that when a path like this one at the bottom is available. Uh, this path just uses the two high capacity edges, and if we use that path, if we use that as an augmenting path, it would let us increase the flow by a thousand all at once. And like I said, we only have to change a tiny thing. For Ford Fulkerson, we were, we were pretending that we're using depth first search.
Uh, it didn't really specify, so pretend that's what we picked. Um, for Edmund's carp, we will promise to use breadth first search. That means that we will never take a longer path if a shorter one is available, where longer and shorter are measured as number of edges. So this up here is a three edge path. Uh, DFS uh, might find this path first, but breadth first search, since it searches for nearby vertices first and then vertices that are further away and vertices that are further away, it will find this shorter two hop path first. So, uh, if, so now we've got, I guess, enough of an algorithm that we could write it down. Uh, if I had to describe Edmund's carp, I would say it uh, starts by making the residual graph. It looks for a augmenting path using BFS, and if it finds one, it increases the flow across that augmenting path by um, whatever the critical edge is, and then it repeats. It looks for another path. Uh, augmenting path via breadth first search, and it just keeps doing that until it can't find one anymore. We could watch this running. I don't know if it's, if it's necessary to do that. The uh, illustra It's posted online, and the illustration would look a lot like for the Ford Volkerson we just saw. It's just it would use a breadth first search discipline, so it would find paths in a different order. Um, now we've got to analyze this algorithm. So the point was um, uh, Ford Fulkerson might have bad behavior because it might have a number of iterations that depends on the, the value of the maximum flow. Does this one do any better? Well, internally, every iteration still costs the same. It's using breadth first search, which you'll remember had a cost of V plus E. As long as our graph is connected, we can assume that's, you know, uh, no, no worse than O of E. Uh, increasing the flow, uh, once we find a critical edge and increase the flow, uh, that costs us at worst, uh, at most, O of V, the number of vertices, because no path could be longer than that. Same thing here, if the graph's connected, this O of V is bounded above by O of E. So we're still at just O of E. So I think the only question that remains is how many augmenting paths might we have to find? Ford Fulkerson uh, might have to go through a lot of them. The nice thing is for Edmunds Carp, it's only going to depend on the structure of the graph. Making this argument takes a moment, but I'll try to talk through it in a way that makes sense. And again, the point we want to show here is um, the number of augmenting paths we find doesn't, it only depends on the structure of the graph. Uh, to make this argument, the first thing we should notice is when you, uh, as you run iterations of Edmunds Carp, as you increase the flow across a augmenting path, Vertices can never get closer to the source, where closer is measured as the number of edges. So what we think we can't, or what we want to show we can't have, is if S is the source and B is some vertex, if you run an iteration of Edmunds Carp, if you increase the flow along an augmenting path, the path from S to B can never get shorter. It can get longer, but when you increase the flow, uh, vertices, uh, they might stay at the same distance from the source, they may get further away from the source measured in total number of edges, they just can't get closer. And the way we'll make this argument is we'll say, well, pretend there was a vertex B that gets closer to the source after you increase the flow along an augmenting path. And to make the argument a little easier to finish, we'll say, well, pretend the B is the first guy who does this. Pretend it's the closest vertex to the source that gets closer uh, after you increase the flow along an augmenting path. Um, let's pretend <coughs> that, uh, so, so again, we're saying pretend B is the first guy that this happens to. So somehow, before you augmented the flow, you had a longer path to B, and now it got shorter. Well, in that new shorter path, Let's call A the vertex that comes before B on that path. So following that path, A is just the name for 
the the guy before B. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, so if we say uh, I introduced this notation on the previous slide, but I didn't describe it. So let's say uh, the distance to D before you augment is, uh, sorry, the distance to B before you augment is D, and then it gets smaller. It goes down to D prime, where D prime, that's the new distance to B, where D prime is less than D. Well, if this is the new shorter path to B, if it's a distance of D prime to B to this guy, it must be a distance of d prime minus one, one less to get to a if it's the vertex right before b. Um, so a must be even closer to the source than b, but it didn't get closer when we augmented along that path because we're assuming b is the first guy that that happens to. It's the first vertex that gets closer. So that means if this is a shorter path, this edge right here must not have existed before we augmented along that path. Otherwise, we would have already had this path to B, and the distance wouldn't have gotten shorter, it would have stayed the same. So that must be a edge that got created, or I guess the way we were saying it before, that had a capacity that was zero before we augmented, and then its capacity went up by one when we augmented, which means the augmenting path we used must have looked like this. Again, we're saying, well, if, if A didn't get any closer, but B got closer, this edge must not have been there, so it must have gotten, gotten created when we augmented along that path. So it means the augmenting path must have looked like this. We must have, um, if there, there must not have been an edge from A to B. The path must have gone to B, and then to A, and then the rest of the way through the source, and then when we augmented, we got less capacity going this way across this edge, and we got some capacity, some non-zero capacity going the other way. Let's see, backing up, that's the only way this edge could get created or, or could have its residual capacity go from zero to positive. So this edge must have, sorry, this edge must have been used along an augmenting path. But Edmonds Carp would never do this. It would never use a path that looked like this, because it always uses shortest paths. Uh, and this can't be a shortest path to the, from the source to the sink. And again, it always uses shortest paths where that's measured as the total number of edges. Why do I say it would never use a path like this? Well, we just said the distance to A is uh, d had to be uh, d minus 1, but along this path you're taking a longer way to get to A. Uh, a dis before augmenting, the distance to this guy we said was d, and the distance to this uh, must be at least um, d plus 1, uh, or let me try and say that maybe in a way that's easier to follow. If there's a path that goes uh, to B, and then to A, and then the rest of the way to the T, you would have had a shorter path by going from S to A. We already said there's a shorter path from S to A. We said that right uh, here, and then going to T. Uh, so a path that gets there via B would have to be a longer path. Uh, and like I said, Edmonds Carp would never use that. It only uses shortest paths. So we can't have vertices like B that get closer to the source when we, uh, when we augment along an augmenting path. Um, how are we going to use this? So that was our first step in making the runtime argument, but now we can just try to remember that uh, vertices never get closer to the source. Uh, they can stay the same distance whenever we augment, they can get further away, but they never get closer. So now we can make um, the rest of the argument by talking about... Uh, sorry. We can make the rest of the argument by talking about uh, how... Um, Oh, what happens to particular edges? Sorry, I got distracted by something going on down here. Um, 
Uh, so if we think about an edge, like the red one that I've drawn here, if we think about how many times it might be the critical edge on an augmenting path, remember every augmenting path has at least one critical edge, uh, you know, the, whatever the tightest bottleneck is on that path. Um, if we think about an edge like this, how many times could it be the critical edge on so, some augmenting path? The reason this matters, at least the reason this is useful to think about, is well, if that edge gets used as the augmenting, as the critical edge on an augmenting path, it goes away. Uh, when we, if this is an augmenting path, like I've drawn at the top of the slide, and that red one is a critical edge, increasing the flow to saturate the critical edge. Uh, takes that guy's residual capacity down to zero. It goes away. We get a back edge uh, when we do that. So this edge going from J back to I will still exist. This edge is gone, at least for the time being. It might become available later after a bunch of iterations, but that's only after we... Um, Sorry, I'm trying to see if I've got a good picture for that. That's only after we use this edge as an edge on, a crit on an augmenting path. Not necessarily the critical edge, but think about it. If this red edge gets used as a critical edge, its residual cross capacity drops to zero, and it's going to stay at zero until you push some commodity in the other direction. So until you use this backward edge on some critical path. So if we think about what we just showed about distance, if this red edge gets used, is the critical edge on an augmenting path. Um, let's say J is at a distance, let's say I is at a distance of D and J is at a distance of D plus one. That edge is gonna go away and this is kind of, sorry, this is kind of what I was, yeah, I lost my slide here. This is kind of what I was saying on the previous slide. That edge is going to stay gone until you augment an along an augmenting path that uses this back edge. Um, when you augment along an augmenting path that uses this back edge, J can't have gotten any closer to the source, because that's what we showed with our previous argument. So it must still be at a distance of D plus one. So in this augmenting path, I here must be at a distance of d plus 2. Uh, otherwise, we would have found some other shorter way of getting to the sink. So when you get some capacity back on the edge from I to J, I must be even a little further away at a distance of d plus 2. Um, and then when, if this red edge ever got to be the critical edge, now I would have to be at a distance of D plus 2, and J would have to be at a distance of D plus 3. So every time this edge, or in general any edge, gets to be the critical edge on an augmenting path, uh, each time it gets to do that, if it gets to do that multiple times, it has to be at least two edges further from the source. That's what I'm trying to illustrate over here with this wiggly path. Every time, for any edge, it might get to be the multiple, sorry, the critical edge on an augmenting path, maybe even multiple times, but only so many times, because it must be, its endpoints must be getting further away from the source every time you do that. And so this lets us put a bound on the algorithm. Paths can't be any longer than V minus one edges. So every edge, at worst, every edge gets to be the critical edge as many times as possible. Uh, well, distances can't be any more than V, and it's getting two uh, units, two edges further away every time, so it can only be the critical edge V over two times. There are only E edges, so if every edge got to be the critical edge the maximum number of times, that would mean we can only have O of V times E uh, iterations, and that's enough to let us finish the analysis. So we could have up to O of V times E iterations. And we already said every iteration costs O of E time. So our total running time is just the product of those. So that's O of V, o of v times E times E, or O of V times E squared. 
That doesn't look too bad like that. If you uh, re, uh, and maybe that's way better than what we might expect with Ford Fulkerson, where we could get that pathological behavior. But as a graph algorithm, uh, you know, this is pretty expensive. If you express it uh, in terms of number of vertices, then if you had a dense graph, you, e could be up to v squared. And in that case, this O of v times e squared, um, I hope I said that right, e could be up to v squared in a dense graph. So in that case, this becomes just O of uh, v to the fifth which is pretty expensive, uh, especially for a non-trivial graph. Uh, this, like it says on my slide, this is the most expensive graph algorithm we've seen so far. We can do better than this. And really our last approach to talking about these is going to be a, really a class of algorithms called the push relabel algorithm. I'm going to stop this recording right now. I think I'll probably split this into two recordings. Let me stop this. Uh, I think it's probably gone on for a little bit. Uh, see how much time it took. And then I'll record the second part, uh, which should get us through the rest of this lecture material. Uh, thanks for your attention. I'll see you next time.